All right, so welcome. We are in the middle of, I think it's week 13. Um, yeah, I think it's week 13. We are finishing our urinary system today. Again, we are going to start our chapter on acid base water and electrolyte balance Friday. We're going to finish that Monday since next week is the holiday. We will um, not have class Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then when we come back at the end of November, beginning of December, we have reproduction. Then we have tests and labs and the final exam. Again, the final exam is comprehensive. It is going to open up on the Friday, the 11th of December. So those of you that have to take this over a weekend can do so um, because everything has to be done by December 17th so I can post grades on the 18th. That's my deadline, and I can't give anybody any extensions beyond that. All right. So. Shifting back, you have three ADI, ADILT labs due. Hopefully everybody's working through them. And as they're working through them and they're rehashing this material on the kidneys, on reabsorption, on secretion, on filtration, it's making more sense. Hopefully everyone's beginning to create, again, maybe a study sheet, a diagram that helps them understand anatomical features and locations, histological layers and tissues present, and the physiology of how reabsorption of materials that are filtered is occurring, how secretion is occurring, how water is being drawn um, through osmosis uh, back into our system, and we're creating from the droplet in each nephron that we pull out of plasma, we're creating a smaller intense little droplet full of waste products and water that is going to then head and become urine and retaining and keeping the important molecules for the function of um, returning that important material back to our bodies, okay? All right, well, where is it? There it is, okay, there it is, okay. No, that's my inbox. Wait. Nope, that's not what I wanted. You don't want to read my emails. Um, I'm trying to get to the whiteboard I created. All right, let's see. There, there we go. Okay. All right, so here we are with the slides and material I want to cover today. Okay, so we have now gone through again the parts of the nephron. So everybody should be comfortable with this part, all of it being my um, renal corpuscle of the nephron. There is an afferent arterial and there is an efferent arterial. There is a glomerulus inside and the capsule again is going to have the podocytes and then it's going to have the simple squamous epithelium and that connective tissue. Okay, the purpose of this corpuscle is filtration. Remember filtration is to sample plasma blood plasma into this tubing that then I can manipulate and manipulate it to return the important items but spit out and remove and secrete away waste products. Okay, and remember that you need a stable filtration. You need that every nephron in the kidney is taking a good sample of plasma so I can effectively get rid of waste and efficiently return water and nutrients back into my body, okay? Now, your glomerular filtration rate, okay? One of the things that you do need to know is if I want to make it go up, so if I want to increase GFR, how do I do that, okay? One of the ways to increase GFR would be one, dilate my afferent arterial. 
Now, why would dilating my afferent arterial increase GFR? Remember, if I dilate my afferent arterial, all right, I'm going to send more blood into the capillary, and I'm going to make the hydrostatic pressure of the blood pushing on the capillary wall go up. And so we basically think of it as if I open the faucet to a higher amount, I am putting more fluid through the tubes, I'm putting more fluid through the hose, and more fluid through the hose is going to force more fluid to be forced or filtered out. Okay. The other way I can potentially make GFR go up would be leave the afferent arterial alone and instead constrict the efferent arterial. Now, the efferent arterial, if I have a bathtub, think of it as the drain. If I am putting water in a bathtub and I don't change the amount of water coming into the bathtub, but I plug the drain or I make the drain less open so the water is not going to leave as quickly as it's coming in, I am going to, in a sense, by constricting that efferent arterial, I am going to make the fluid in the capillary get more robust because it's going to enter the capillary faster than it leaves, and that is going to increase capillary hydrostatic pressure. And as I increase capillary hydrostatic pressure, all right, I am going to then make more fluid exit out through filtration forces. Okay. Now, another way to potentially, again, make GFR go up would be to go back to mean blood pressure. And remember, mean blood pressure is a function of cardiac output, all right, and vascular resistance, total peripheral resistance. If I go back and I make mean blood pressure go up, now, how do I make mean blood pressure go up? I could make cardiac output go up, all right? I could make mean blood pressure go up by causing, again, more peripheral resistance. Again, I'm not going to grow taller in a second. I'm not going to grow longer in a second. I'm not going to probably alter gravity in a split second. But if I cause vascular resistance, the radius of lots of arterials throughout my vascular network to constrict, I am going to make mean blood pressure go up. Remember, that mean blood pressure is normally 120 over 80. Again, that's the systolic pressure. That's the diastolic pressure. And if you add them together and divide by two, mean blood pressure pressure is usually 100 millimeters of mercury, okay? If I make my mean blood pressure go up, because again, I make cardiac output go up, so these systolic and diastolic values increase, so the average of them goes up, or I make vascular resistance go up by constricting a lot of arterials, and again, that means I have to push blood into smaller tubes, so that's going to make my systolic and diastolic pressures go up, which again will make my mean blood pressure go up. That would end up if the resistance across the network stays approximately the same and I get to the kidneys with higher blood pressure, higher blood pressure means I'm going to force more blood into the glomerulus and that's going to then lead to increased filtration because the capillary hydrostatic pressure that the blood coming into the glomerulus is going to have is going to be a slightly higher than it normally is because I started with a higher pressure. Okay, so again, anytime you talk about the nephron, how do I make the nephron have more filtration? How do I increase the filtration rate? You are going to tend to maybe locally dilate the afferent arterial or constrict the efferent. And so while changes might not be happening in my blood pressure to my brain, in my blood pressure to my gut, in my capillary flow to my muscles, in my capillary flow to my heart, I will see that I change the capillary flow and blood flow into the nephron. And by changing it and making more capillary hydrostatic pressure, I will increase my GFR. On the flip side, if I do something that makes my blood pressure go up, so sitting here right now at rest, if I start again having sympathetic outflow because I'm stressed, I'm worried about COVID, I'm worried about bills, I'm worried about what I'm going to eat, I'm worried about the dog, I'm worried about my kids, and I start having all this stress and anxiety and my blood pressure starts to increase, 
at rest, that increased blood pressure is going to then cause more blood pressure as my blood flows to all the organs, more flow of blood into those capillary beds, and that would then cause more filtration to happen in my kidneys. Okay, so flip it. Anytime I want to decrease my filtration, all right, so I want GFR my filtration rate to go down. And again, I would probably want that to happen maybe during times where I'm sleeping and I don't want to lose as much fluid and accumulate as much urine. I would then want to locally constrict the afferent arterial, making capillary hydrostatic pressure go down and less fluid in the capillaries, less fluid in the hose, less water leaks out. Or locally work on dilating my efferent arterial and again by letting the drain of the tub the bathtub let the water out faster than it's coming in I'll have less fluid less blood in the capillary glomerulus pushing on the wall forcing fluid out and that's how I can do it or again more big picture at rest make my mean blood pressure decrease and again make cardiac output go down make vascular resistance go down or other forms of total peripheral resistance decrease so again maybe my systolic becomes 110 my diastolic becomes 70 so now my mean blood pressure is 90 millimeters per mercury and so the amount of fluid with the pressure on it going into all my capillary beds is a little less, so a little less fluid is leaking out, okay? I don't think we talked about that yet, and this is something you want to know. How do I increase or decrease the rate of fluid I take from plasma in my nephron? And again, you do that with local factors, with uh, the nervous system, with hormones, all right? So again, what tends to make arteries constrict? Well, neurologically, uh, sympathetic outflow, so norepinephrine or, um, uh, what am I doing, okay? Norepinephrine or epinephrine would potentially make my arteries arterioles dilate or constrict and that could potentially again depending on if it happens to the afferent could cause uh, GFR to go down all right versus if it happens to the efferent that could potentially make GFR go up all right if it happens to both chances are GFR will technically uh, decrease because the blood flow into the glomerulus and the blood flow to the kidneys decreased okay but when we think about like prostaglandin, normally makes artery arterioles constrict. Histamine usually makes them dilate. So again, if local factors, we release a bunch of histamine or prostaglandin on just the afferent or just the efferent arterial, those could be ways we could influence GFR. Um, and then again, anything that does anything to big blood pressure, mean blood pressure, usually without considering that we're exercising, so this is at rest, that can also affect then your kidneys and their glomerular filtration rate. Okay, so that's what's going on in the nephron. Those are important points. In the PCT, one of the things you want to see is, again, there is 60 to 70 percent of our reabsorption occurring there. Okay, and that reabsorption is going to be uh, hopefully all the glucose. And whether or not it's all the glucose or not, I don't know how to make this thing go away. Go away. Okay, all right. Whether or not it's all the glucose or not comes to what we are going to call this T max. This means that. How many receptors do I have and what is their max rate they work? And so for glucose, I know that my T max, again, is somewhere around, if I have 300 molecules of glucose per deciliter of blood, 
that is the maximum amount of glucose that I can, based on the number of receptors I have and those receptors working at their optimal, most efficient ability, that is the maximum amount of glucose that I can pull in from my filtrate back into my bloodstream. So anything that is over Tmax, so if I have 325 glucose molecules per deciliter of plasma, when I'm in my proximal, I'll be able to take the 300, but I will not be able to take the 25 because that's 25 molecules of glucose over the Tmax. And because it's over, that glucose is then not, by the end of the proximal tubule, going to be completely reabsorbed. And those 25 molecules of glucose are going to, for the rest of the tube, alter and influence now all of my oncotic or my osmosis forces and they are going to lead to in my loop I am going to reach my 600 and my 800 and my 1200 milliosmoles per liter of saturation all right I'm going to hit that faster than I normally would so it's going to lead to more water being lost than I would probably ideally like. And if water accumulates and forms in urine at a faster rate and I am peeing at a higher rate, that's what we call a diuretic effect. And that's part of the reason why a symptom of diabetics who are not controlling their glucose is high urine output. And diabetes, because there are forms of diabetes that are not glucose related, that's diabetes insipidus. Diabetes as a disease means high urine output, right? So diabetes mellitus is again related to glucose levels. Diabetes insipidus would be related to ADH not working. And if ADH never works, think about you, think about again, never having ADH able to pull water in on the collecting duct, you would have a high urine output, you would be more prone to dehydration. And again, the thirst because ADH is not working on the kidneys to retain the water. And so you have a form of high urine output, diabetes formed by the lack of the hormone ADH. Okay, so again, one of the key concepts is 60 to 70 percent of reabsorption occurs in the PCT. The reabsorption for things like glucose and some of your uh, other small organic molecules and amino acids, they will be recovered based on their Tmax. And in healthy, normal individuals, the Tmax is usually a huge value, two or three times the normal amount. All right, and so normal healthy people should not have the amount of molecules in their blood at two or three times the normal rate. So the Tmax is usually perfectly aligned to recover any and all those molecules for normal healthy conditions. And again, the reason why most people are not getting glucose lower than 300 is because they're not making insulin. So it's a hormone slash kidney interaction occurring. Okay, so remember the next part? Okay, one more thing on the PCT. As I'm going to pull out all of these important molecules, I am going to secrete in some of my waste products. And so that would be, uh, I don't know why that's doing that. Um, that would be why, okay, uh, why you see I'm trying to delete. Okay. That would be why you see in the pink box over here that at the end of the PCT, if I started with a pH of 7, work, 7.4, all right, okay, I should end with a pH. Okay, so if I started with the pH over here at 7.4, because that's what it's in plasma, because I'm accumulating all of these hydrogens and all of these other acids, I might end up with a pH over here at 6 or 5, all right? Because again, the solutes that are being taken out 
are replaced by more hydrogen ions, more urea, more ammonia, more uric acid, okay, and other toxins and drugs that we want to get rid of, all right? Moving into the loop, all right? So again, the loop is going to have areas where we are going to thick pull in salts, okay? And then the thin, you are going to pull out the hot water based on there is high solute concentration in the extracellular fluid versus in this fluid, there's low solute concentration, all right? And again, those those loops that are part of your juxtamedullary me, uh, nephrons that go deep into the pyramids, they get to go into these solute concentration areas where 800 and 1200 solutes per liter exist, and that really lets those nephrons uh, pull back a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of the water. Whereas many of our cortical nephrons may only get barely into a region of the pyramid, a region of the cord, uh, medulla, where maybe the solute concentration is 600. So they're still going to get to use that higher solute concentration outside versus inside, but they're not going to get to the extremes to really, really recover maybe as much of the water. Okay, and then once we get to our DCT, everything at this point is going to be hormone driven. And remember, our big hormones that we like to talk about are aldosterone with the goal of dumping potassium. All right, we have ADH, which again is all about retaining water. Okay, we have parathyroid hormone and calcitonin, which work to regulate our calcium levels. And then remember, we have ANP and BNP, and they are, again, trying to not let aldosterone and ADH work as well. And by doing that, they are trying to usually help us uh, dump water, not retain water. Okay? All right. Um, again, collecting duct is ADH, where our last-ditch effort to retain water and to try to, again, make a urine little particle that has just a little bit of fluid and is made up of lots and lots and lots and lots of hydrogens, ammonia, urea, uric acid molecules that then can go and become part of our urine, okay? All right, so let's talk about characteristics of urine. All right, so these two slides here. Okay, so one of the things about urine. Urine is going to be mostly water. It is going to have some solutes, and because some of those solutes, those amines groups, and some of those solutes that are bilirubin, some of them are creatine, they uh, have a little yellowish hue when light shines on them, okay? So the, the urine will be mostly water, and it'll have some solutes suspended in it, and the amount of certain solutes of urochrome, bilirubin, urea, ammonia, could influence it to be more yellow versus light yellow, okay? Um, if the urine is less water and heavily suspended amounts of solutes, then the color will look darker. If the urine is more water and therefore the solutes are suspended more dispersed, more widely spread out, then the uh, urine will appear more clear, all right? So the coloring of the urine is usually related more to the amount of water, not necessarily the amount of urea and ammonia, okay? So the urea, the ammonia, the bilirubin, the urochrome, all of that is either it's in a small little fluid amount, so again, it's more syrupy because it's closer together and therefore you shine light, more molecules in a small space, they absorb more of that yellow light energy, versus if it's in a big beaker, the uh, molecules are spread out, and so when you shine a light through, there's not a lot of molecules close together to block that light energy and make it appear a darker color. Okay, um, you can end up with some drugs, some vitamin supplements. Um, if you ever take a multivitamin, sometimes because of the filler material, it might make your pee have a 
smell and it might make it have a more greenish hue just because of the way those fillers work. One time I think the kids had to take an antibiotic or a drug and it made their pee turn a little pink because of some of the dye or some of the um, cat like scaffolding molecules that the drug was attached to um, and then when it is put in water without the drug attached to it it made it look more pink so again your pee will maybe change a little bit in color dep depending upon again some of those other molecules you have that you take in uh, maybe because they're part of a drug or maybe because they're part of uh, some food or some supplement but for the most part the pee is normally yellowish in color okay um, Urine is not supposed to be cloudy, so the molecules suspended in them are supposed to be small solutes. So because they're small, they are clear, they are not going to be large enough to make a cloudy urine. If your urine starts to look cloudy, that could indicate things like albumin, things like big uh, molecules or cells are getting into the urine and that could be an indication at some point in some way that you have breaks or tears in the integrity of the system allowing those big items into the urine. Again the pH can range from 6 all the way down to even 4 if you are vegetarian because if you eat a lot of um, vegetarians sometimes they eat a lot of foods that are very basic in their diet if you are that or for some reason you have some type of metabolic or respiratory alkalosis going on that could be a reason why your body is now using the urine to dump your base your bicarbonate and it could then lead to your urine to being basic vegetarians like I said who eat a very rich diet that is uh, basic so very alkaline, they can sometimes end up with urine that tends to be a little more basic. But most of us, we drink orange juice, we drink fruits and vegetables, we eat food, we drink, eat meat, we eat things that are ba uh, acidic, and so we are on top of the acids that we make, we are adding more acid to our system from the foods we take in, and so we have a high acid load and we use our urine to get rid of it. All right. So on the average, urine is 95% water and 5% sol solutes. If you remember, uh, blood plasma was about 92% water. So even when the kidneys aren't doing great, they're still making urine that is slightly um, more rich in solutes than your blood plasma. Okay, So the end result is that urine tends to, even on average normal days, it tends to be slightly more high in solute concentration than your blood plasma. All right. And again, we are going to have to use uh, urine to get rid of many of our nitrogenous waste because, again, we when we break down amino acids, when we break down DNA and RNA, again, we liberate these nitrogenous groups and these nitrogenous groups can be toxic to us if we don't get rid of them. So we have to then make them into molecules that we can move around and put in urine and void out of the system to get rid of them. Okay. Um, and again, most of the normal things you can see in urine are going to be these molecules, which are our waste products. But you will potentially see sodium and potassium and phosphate and calcium and bicarbonate ions. You might see, again, some excess amino acids, some excess hormones. Um, again, because we pee on sticks to be able to tell us if we're ovulating or if we're pregnant. We know that people who eat, again, high protein diets, they are eating so much amino acid um, that we can't Again, we reach those T maxes and we can't return all the alanine and all the tyrosine and all that because, again, we don't need all of it because we only need a certain amount of it. Any excess will then be dumped. All right. So, people that, again, eat those high protein diets and then after their workouts are always taking their protein shakes, they are making very expensive urine because the body can only absorb so much protein, so much per body gram. That's part of the reason if you go back and look at nutritional guides, the goal is to take in a certain amount of protein per your weight, per your grams of lean muscle mass, because that's about the amount that you can process and utilize. 
okay what you should not see in urine then are white blood cells red blood cells albumin and then excessive large amounts of amino acids any and all glucose uh, because again if we start to not diet related see high amino acid loss if we see again not um diet related or again just abnormal body issues we see glucose showing up in our urine we might be in a disease state like i have uh, diabetes if we start to see albumin white blood cells and red blood cells something is going on and our podocyte and our endothelial cell filtration to prevent those cells and molecules from getting into the filtrate is not working or further downstream because there's a long way from the nephron to the urethra somewhere in the bladder somewhere in the ureter somewhere in the urethra there's some type of break or tear that's letting blood and blood cells and albumin get in inappropriately which then is causing again um, loss of those molecules and we want to keep our red blood cells we want to keep our white blood cells we want to keep our albumin for the functions they serve for osmosis and immune and oxygen carrying capacity all right so that's what urine should look like all right so we've created at the end of the collecting duct a little droplet from a bunch of these nephrons that little droplet may take sway through the minor and the major calluses to the renal pelvis and then it's going to enter the ureters all right once it's in the ureters we are now going to see that that is a piece of urine that is no longer has any opportunity chance anything to get back into our system the cells that are going to interact are going to be transitional epithelial cells around those transitional mucosa epithelial cell layer is going to be uh, some muscle layers so when I am sleeping when I don't have gravity available I can use peristalsis to push the fluid from the renal pelvis in the beginning of the ureter down into the bladder and then because again the kidneys are retroperitoneal the outer layer of the ureter is going to be an adventitia it's going to be a connective tissue layer that can tie in to the connective tissue around the adipocytes the connective tissue around blood vessels around nerves around the uh, connective tissue around muscle that is you know making a little bit of space to let the ureter pass from the kidneys and connect to the bladder all right um, when we look in the book you should see again a picture or in your lab manual all right the ureter is going to you know it's not a perfect hole so that stratified squamous epithelium is going to again be thick and it's going to have um, not a perfectly uh, symmetrical hole that the urine droplets are going through that's why if your urine droplet is so rich in solutes and the solutes end up being things like calcium and sodium and potassium and chloride and phosphate that can form crystals that crystal formation can then rip and tear the transitional epithelial mucosa layer and that is what we then associate as a kidney stone a piece of urine that again has so many solutes that are ions capable of forming ionic bonds that then crystallize and form a solid structure right they no longer stay in liquid form they become a solid form and as they are then with peristalsis help pushed down through the ureter and those spiky pointy crystal formations rip and tear into those cells that's what passing a kidney stone is and you think um, when we go to space we know that astronauts because they're not loading they're not having gravitational forces on their bone we know that the calcium ion um, load increases and you actually see in the first few weeks of being in the space station or being in the space that your calcium uh, excretion goes up a tremendous amount and so one of the things that is a big like no-go you will never get to be an astronaut is if you have a pro uh, a history or a family history of high um, kidney stone 
issues, you've had kidney stones, you have high incidence of kidney stones, they will not let you be an astronaut because that high load of calcium puts you at increased risk for a, bone, a stone forming. And if you have uh, the stone form in space and it's so big that it would require surgery, they can't get to you or they'd have to do a special research or special mission of sending up some type of capsule or rocket to get you, and that costs millions and billions of dollars. So that's part of the reason why traditionally astronauts will not have a history of kidney stones, and if you ever end up having a kidney stone, you could potentially then become permanently grounded and no longer able to go to space. So that's just a little tidbit there, okay? So again, the ureters are going to connect, so you can see them coming here, all right? And they are going to connect to the bladder, and there's two openings where they are going to deposit their liquid, all right? There is a third opening, which is to your urethra, all right? And again, in our bladder, this little triangle is formed, all right? And that is known as our... Um, our trigon, which is basically a little triangle formation of where the two ureters deposit fluid in and the urethral opening, which lets fluid out. Now, the urethral opening here at the bladder start and the urethral start is known as your internal urethral sphincter. And remember, that is going to be a smooth muscle sphincter. So that is under involuntary control, right? So whether the sphincter dilates or constricts is going to be under neurotransmitter, usually parasympathetic control. Uh, again, parasympathetic control is going to try to influence this to relax. It's going to be under uh, local control. So Again, local reflexes that will try to get it to dilate or relax when the bladder starts to be stretched and stretched due to high urine uh, volume, which then means it's getting full. All right. And then the other end of the urethra will have a second sphincter, and that's the external urethral sphincter. Remember, that one is skeletal muscle. So that one is under conscious awareness, and it's going to be, again, a motor neuron. All right. Right, that then we, we, we uh, release and we try to cause the muscle cell to relax and we do that when we want to void our urine. All right. Now, any skeletal muscle, if you put enough urine and you put enough weight, all right, it will try to stay closed, it'll try, try to stay contracted, but at some point in time, you are going to have the weight increase to an amount that it can't stay closed and it's going to collapse. It's going to open and then you end up with urine on your clothes or urine not quite making it all the way to the toilet. And with kids, they have to learn how to sense, again, through potty training, when the external sphincter initially tells them I'm constricted and I'm holding, uh, and they need to recognize that signal means go to the bathroom now, not go to the external sphincter saying I'm constricting and I'm about to lose it, and they don't make it to the potty. Okay? All right, other features of the bladder. Again, um, the top outer part of the bladder is going to be your visceral peritoneum. This is where the visceral peritoneum somewhat ends. And then the sides and any underbelly of the bladder, any external features of the urethra, that is now going to then be an adventitia. All right, so connective tissue to help it hold in place. Okay, um, the detrusor muscle is the name for the muscle that is going to line that middle part between the transitional epithelium of the mucosa and the adventitia or the visceral peritoneum, all right? And uh, when we get to the urethra, we'll see the urethral opening is known as the external urethral orifice, and in males, your urethra is going to have segments. The first segment will be when it flows through the, um, the prostate. 
then it'll go through this little area where it's surrounded by the bulbal urethral gland, which is going to usually be what flushes out the urethra before ejaculation. Um, and it's supposedly full of very alkaline, basic secretions. So that way, any acid droplets of urine left in the urethra are negated or neutralized. And then the part of the urethra that's surrounded, again, by your... Um, erectile tissue will be known as your um, spongy urethra, all right? So it's going to be surrounded by your corpus spongiosum and your corpus cavernosum. And that's the tissue that, again, is involved in causing an erection when you get dilation of blood vessels and more filtration pressure, more fluid leaking out, more fluid filling the spongy open area to engorge and cause turgor pressure and cause an erection of the penis. Okay. All right. So Again, these are going to be many of the items you need to know for lab, for um, identification. All right. And our last physiological thing we want to talk about in the kidney is, of course, mictrition, how to cause urine to be voided. All right. Now, in general, you see in our bladder there are stretch receptors. Okay, and these stretch receptors are going to, with increased fluid accumulation, cause the transitional epithelium to be pushed on, to be stretched, to be pushed more open. And the mucosa and the transitional epithelium, it's normally, you know, kind of rugae, all right? It's, it's all kind of in a, a unstretched manner. It forms like hills and valleys. But when it's stretched, the rugae flattens out. All right, and that allows, again, more pressure to be exerted on the stretch receptors found in that detrusor muscle area, and that is going to then be a way, you see that a stretch receptor, that afferent sensory neuron comes into the S2 region of your spinal cord. Remember that this is parasympathetic input area and output area, all right, and it's going to bind to... Uh, an interneuron, one of those interneurons is going to cause a reflex loop that is going to get, again, parasympathetic neurons. So here's our first order neuron, the preganglionic neuron. Here's our second order neuron, our postganglionic neuron. Remember, acetylcholine is released in this neurotransmitter's location. And then we're going to see that postganglionic neuron come and tell the internal urethral sphincter to dilate. Okay? Now, as I go back here, another part of this afferent sensory neuron is going to take a trip up through the, again, usually like the dorsal um, white columns to the brain, to the pons of the midbrain. And it's going to, again, carry a signal that I have a full bladder. Now, for anyone who's ever done a long car trip, Remember, stretch receptors will initially stretch, and then if that kind of holds steady for a little while, they'll stop sending an impulse. And so they will stop telling you after a little while your bladder's full. And if so, if you ignore the initial signals of bladder full, you might be able to let more filling occur and then more stretching occur, and then you get the signal later, maybe 30 minutes, maybe an hour later, that, hey, my bladder's full. Okay, and so one of the things, again, about our bladder is it can hold up to about 0.8 um, of a liter, so about 800 milliliters, and in big people, maybe it's even one liter. So it wants to tell you at around 250 milliliters, hey, I'm full, void me. So if you ignore it, it might be that you get up to 350 or 325, you know, before you get the signal, hey, I'm full, void me. And if you, again, ignore it again, you might get up to 500. My point being, yes, you can ignore some of your signals of void my urine, void and void and void, but once the internal sphincter 
is going to relax, that urine is now pressing on your external sphincter. And so in guys, the urethra is a little longer, so they might not feel this pressure to void as significantly and as quickly as maybe females, all right? But you are going to, again, continue to ignore, continue to ignore, continue to fill, to fill, to fill, and that bladder is going to eventually cause enough pressure, enough force on the external sphincter that it will fail and it will let urine out. So you won't blow up your urine um, and end up with it turning septic, okay? All right, um, but if you don't ignore those signals, you'll void and maybe get 250, 300 uh, mils out um, at a time. And so if you go back and think about it, when they give you a cup to urinate in, I mean, that cup is like, you know, maybe holds 500 milliliters. Uh, and they usually give you a cup and they hope that you can fill it, you know, around 100 to 200 mils. Not really a lot of urine. Um, and that's part of the reason why you don't have to basically be ready to burst when you do a pee test um, because, again, they just need to get a nice sampling of urine. Granted, anytime you do urine test and you're testing for molecules, it's always best to get the first urinary sample of the day. Why? Because for the last five, six, seven hours, ADH has been recalling water back into our system in the collecting duct, and so the urine is probably its darkest, its most potent, full of solutes that have been accumulating over five to six hours of filtration. And so if I'm looking for this one or two molecules of HCG, which is the pregnancy hormone, I'm more likely to find it in a sample from uh, my first void of urine in the morning than I am to find it maybe two hours into my day or two hours after lunch when I've maybe peed two or three times and I'm getting only a sample of urine that's mostly water and a few solutes and less likely to maybe have enough HCG to trigger the test. Okay, so um, that's kind of again how this works. I suggest you remember and go back through a few things about how most of our signals are going to be parasympathetic and motor and not necessarily sympathetic system um, because again we're looking at this part of the brain, this part of the internal external signals are either motor or parasympathetic coming out of the system. Okay, all right and that's what I have for you guys on the urinary system. So we will pick up on again Friday to go into the next chapter and we'll pick up um, again if anybody wants to have a small group meeting next Tuesday during lab we can do that. For lab tomorrow I will go through again many of the histology, many of the major landmarks, many of the uh, pieces and parts of the nephron and the bladder because that will be on the models. Um, so it, I think I have three or four models to go over so it shouldn't be long um, and so if you have questions or you want to do questions we can do that as well. Alright, so I'm going to stop